Well, the first thing I should have done was uh, brought my laptop instead of my netbook because I can't interface with the projector. But um, we're going to try to use uh, follow the monies. The first thing I'd like to do is uh, thank all of you all for jumping in. Uh, citizen journalists are going to play a really important role in the future of America for a lot of reasons. The way citizen soldiers uh, played an important role in the revolution that led to the founding of this country. And uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, in a way, you really do hark back to the founding days of this country when pamphleteers and um, uh, citizen journalists, there was no other kind at the time really, uh, played a, a really important role in the historic uh, founding of America. And we can't let that, we can't let that slip. The uh, two myths I want to I want to get out of the way at the very beginning. One is that somehow it's the journalists who wrecked the traditional news industry. Um, it wasn't the journalists who wrecked it. It was the corporate suits who did. Uh, it wasn't bad journalism that led to the drop off in uh, readership and viewership, uh, listening uh, to the radio news. Uh, I'm so old that I can remember a time, in fact, I competed with a, uh, with a real local news reporter uh, who worked for a local radio station in a town that I covered. He did a good job. Uh, then the radio people found out they could make more money and cut their expenses by just getting a, a robot feed um, and uh, whack the reporter. So very few radio stations have uh, reporters anymore. Talk radio fills the void. Um, where is he? But it's not like having a professional journalist out on the street. Do you have any reporters? We do, yes. Ah, but, we're a, but we're a statewide network. So yeah. We're, <coughs> in a way, we have our own reporters, but we're also the robot that helps fill that void, too. So. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but the, everything that people are talking about on talk radio is stuff that some reporters somewhere went and dug out and uh, exposed. Uh, talking about it is great, but somebody's got to go get it. Uh, the other myth that I like to uh, disabuse people of is the thought that somehow it was the citizen soldiers, the Minutemen, who won the revolution that founded this country. And it was not. Uh, amateurs, uh, didn't do all that well up against the professional forces of the uh, British Army. Uh, they had to bring in uh, Lafayette and Pulaski to train citizen soldiers uh, to develop a professional army. And uh, the journalists were kind of the equivalent of the professional troops. Uh, Y'all are going to be a lot like uh, irregulars going up against professionals. And the people in government and the people in power play dirty, they play hardball. If you ever happen to get really close to something near and near to their hearts, uh, they will abuse any uh, power of government that they have to shut you up and shut you down. Um, the best way for you to get your message out is to have it conform as much as possible to the hard rules of professional journalism. Number one of those that they don't really talk about in journalism school, and that's really not where you learn to be a professional journalist anyway, is if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Okay. You can talk all you want to, you can blog all you want to, but the fact of the matter is you'll just get lost in the background noise unless other media of all kinds pick up your stuff. And the only way they will pick up your stuff is if they trust it. Your credibility is on the line. You think you're breaking something? Check it out. The only way still to really get good information is out on the street. Foot soldiers, infantry, develop sources, make contacts. It's still a person-to-person, face-to-face task. There's no way of getting around that. 
apply the hard rules of verification, corroboration, get it right. I'll give you an example. Has everybody heard about Bell, California? Okay, you know what happened there? I mean, I hate to tell you, but I think Bell is probably more the rule than the exception in American communities right now. Because they did not have, for a decade at least, real reporters prowling the halls of City Hall, turning stuff over, poking around, asking questions, going to meetings, developing sources, the people running the city of Bell, California, basically stole everything. The only reason that came to light is because a couple of reporters from the Los Angeles Times got onto it. The situation, there were bloggers in Bell who had been blogging about it. There had been people talking about it. There had been some stuff on talk radio about it. Nothing had any impact until the Los Angeles Times reporters got onto it and blasted it on page one. Then suddenly there was movement. Uh, shortly after the story broke, the local Bell Topics newspaper had a page one story about it, which they had to have. The Bell Topics newspaper page one story, story was a Reuters story picked up from The Guardian in England. Okay, so the citizens who had been complaining about this, asking about it, trying to find something out about it in Bell, California, couldn't get anything done. There was no local professional journalist to get anything done. It wasn't until the LA Times reporters picked up on it, started digging into it, and put it on page one that anything happened. Now it looks like there are gonna be some criminal prosecutions. It looks like something's gonna be done. So to get any real action, for example, 50,000 listeners on a, on a daily talk radio show is great. Uh, but even in Montana, that's only 5.2% of the population. The newspapers I worked for, one of them our highest was 73% of the households. We figured 80% of the uh, adult population. When we put something on page one, people paid attention to it. Um, we could move the entire city. There was a good guy who was a mayor. He really tried to be honest. He told me one time that when one of those gray area things comes up with a contractor or a contributor or some, something somebody wanted him to do, he said the one thing he thought of is would he want his family and friends to read it on page one of the Bristol Press? And if he did not want them to see it on page one of the Bristol Press, if he would not want to see it there, he didn't do it. The newspaper was his moral compass. Because if we put it on page one of that newspaper, it was the reality. Everybody knew it. The way you get picked up, the way you get talked about, the way you may get the papers in the state, or the other news organizations in the state to use your stuff is to make sure it's solid, to make sure it meets the rules and, and standards of professional journalism, which are pretty tough. If they know that if your mother says she loves you, you have checked it out, um, they'll pay attention to you, and there is no way you can get the word out without other media picking you up anymore. Twitter is 8% of American adults who are online every day, which is about 70% of American adults. So you can tweet your little heart out and you're not gonna reach anybody. One of the rules I go by is if your mother says she loves you, check it out. If she says it in an email, double check it. If she says it on a blog, triple check it. And if she says it in a tweet, just ignore it. Okay? The, the background noise level's rising. It's getting harder and harder to get a clear signal through. You probably, the subjects you pick up on your show are probably five out of a hundred that you could talk about, right? How do you pick the ones that you talk about? Well, 
If it involves sex, obviously, it'll get listeners. If it involves money or malfeasance or misfeasance, it will. But before you go out with that, you want to make sure you have a fairly solid basis that you're working on, right? If it's uh, somebody who blogged about space aliens taking over the governor, you might back away from it a little bit for a couple of days, right? One of the, a couple of things you can do, and let's see if I can get the links here that I had all set up on my, on my netbook. You can train yourself. The fundamental practices of, um, of good journalism are just good things to know, good things to go by. Get, get the AP style book. Read it. Keep it with you. They have an online uh, subscription that's, I think, I just saw $25 uh, a year. Uh, this is good stuff. Uh, there are sections, and I'll talk uh, in the later thing about libel and defamation, are really fundamental. Uh, know your AB style book. If what you put out, if what is on your blog is solid, not just grammatically correct, I mean, some of the stuff I see on blogs is truly unbelievable. I think of all the blogs that I've ever looked at, ac actual information that I would pick up and use is less than 1%. The rest of it I don't trust. Uh, for one thing, it just doesn't have much original new information. That's what news is. You can't spell news without new, as they used to say. What are you bringing to the table that people go, oh, I didn't know that. I never heard that. Anybody can sit around and uh, you use the thing of the guy in his underwear in his mom's basement um, just blathering about stuff that he's read someplace else. Um, it's still a lot of what it is. Opinions are like, well, I think you all know the old expression, a particular body part. Everybody has one. And uh, they're more interested in their own opinions than they are in yours. Uh, get, get the style book. I, I don't know what you get for 25 bucks a year, but that would be the best deal in the world. I still like the old printed version too, because when I have 17 tabs open on my computer, I really don't want to then go open another one and, and go through the style book. But uh, get one or both. Um, they have a lot of good stuff on guides and briefings. Um, they had some other resources in here too on my other link, but it's a fundamental essential. Journalism is a profession. Uh, I think of, of bloggers and citizen journalists as kind of like the Minutemen going up against the Imperial Army of Britain. Uh, maybe a better analogy now is like a pickup team going into the NFL. When, uh, when things get ugly, they get ugly fast, and I, I, until you've been, like they say, until you've been bitten by a rattlesnake, you really don't know what it's like. Until you are really tangled with these folks, um, it's really hard to comprehend what it's like. Uh, my wife has started calling Baltimore the People's Democratic Republic of Baltimore. Um, and the other thing is if you get it wrong, and it's something important, they will be all over you. The best defense that you have is to follow the uh, uh, tenets of, of professional journalism. I'll go to one other site here. I don't get along too well with touch pads, by the way. You think my mouse would work with you know. Yes. That, that AP style book is updated every year. Yes. As well as, as the news changes, you know. Uh, Tells you which way to spell Gaddafi or... They, are, they also have a book, and I don't see it on here, called The Word, that is uh, an incredible fundamental guide to clear, concise, precise writing. If you, if you use the basic journalism one-on-one -on -one style, you will more clearly communicate more information to people than just rambling. Uh, it is a very... Again, the journalists are not the ones who... Uh, 
she swapped them out on me. Ah, there we go. The journalists are not the ones who wreck the, the newspaper industry. I mean, uh, the news industry. I, I can tell you, it's the radio stations that, that, that uh, had a, a decent reporter, kid reporter or two, they whacked them. Uh, TV news is uh, a real joke. I mean, I, one of our stations a while back, you know, they had their all local all the time um, promo thing that they do when they're going to commercial and she said, when we come back, 35 dying flaming train crash. Well, I jumped off the couch and was starting to call my editors saying, how the hell am I hearing about a fatal flaming train crash all local all the time? Uh, and you guys didn't tell me, call me first. Well, it was a flaming train a crash in Spain when they came back. So I guess not so all local, not so all the time. I got to really see it in newspapers where I had people in communities begging us to put a reporter back in their community. I had a community in Connecticut where the two factions who hated each other beyond comprehension in that community came over as a delegation to talk to the publisher and I about putting a reporter in their community. Wasn't going to happen. Cut back, pull back. I know for an absolute fact that at least 10% of that circulation decline that you're always hearing about with newspapers were full paid year in advance subscribers that we shut off. Shut them off. I know because I heard from most of them at four papers. We shut them off because it was a net loss of a dollar a paper a day to service them. We shut them off because the major advertisers with credit cards and zip codes had figured out, wait a minute, we're not getting any customers from, from that, those zip codes. So whatever your advertising rate was, you have to take those zip codes out and reduce your rate for us by that much. Okay, one area where we cut off 1,200 households, cut them off, had to give them their money back. My publisher said, okay, it's a buck of paper a day. If you want to come up with $350,000 a year out of your budget to service those households with papers, I'll do it. Well, cutting $350,000 a year out of my budget would have, uh, would have reduced my newsroom budget significantly. I think I would have had to have laid off more people than we had. So I know that people are hungry for news. I know that the myth that somehow liberal journalists, which I've never met one, by the way, I don't know which way they lean. They tend to be kind of predators. They don't really care whether it's right or left or whatever. Is it a story? Um, they're not the ones who have led to the decline in news consumption in this country. Okay. The fact is we have a void, somebody's got to fill it. You are the kind of people who can fill it. You're not going to fill it unless you get what's left of those major media, traditional media, to pick up your stuff. And the best way to do that is get it right, get it in a form that they can trust, and train yourself to be more like professionals and less like amateurs. A good place to do that is at Pointer, and I have my problems with Pointer, believe me. But they have some good resources you can use. Now, I'm going to show you all some later, and, and my one this afternoon is part of the whole FOI, libel, legal aspects of being a journalist. You can, and I, I'm not sure how it works, they have in-person online training by topic. Some of their stuff is, uh, some of their stuff is kind of lame, and some of it they have to be, you have to be you know, a professional journalist, whatever that is. I mean, one of the things about the profession of journalism is it truly is the, the people's profession in America and must always be the people's profession. No government or other body can license you, can give you a test. Nobody gets to decide who a journalist is or is not. Uh, the accrediting things that we go through are uh, 
done by the uh, journalism organizations in states, uh, which supposedly makes it fairly independent of government. Uh, I very honestly uh, don't much care for accrediting and I don't care much care for shield laws. As a police reporter, when they try to give me police press credentials to wear at scenes and stuff, I told them I didn't really acknowledge their authority to determine whether I was a journalist or should be at the scene or not. Um, well, uh, basically, it's like press conferences aren't for the press, press conferences are for the politicians. It enables, number one, it saves them time. It allows them to get everybody together and keep the message under control. Um, it's kind of like the last place a real journalist should be is at the press conference. You're not going to find out anything you shouldn't already know anyway, right? At a press conference? I mean, it's a joke. Um, you should already know the questions and the answers. And if you have a really good question, by the way, do go to a press conference. Don't ask it during the press conference. Right? You should have asked it before the press conference or maybe wait till after the press conference, but you got to develop the techniques of a professional journalist, which used to be you learn working with scarred veteran reporters and editors. My city editor uh, not only knew where all the bodies were buried, she buried some of them, <laughs> and uh, including a police chief, a judge, and a number of detectives and uniform officers in a corrupt police department. Um, we're losing that. You all are not getting that. You've got to try to fill that void. The number one way you can do it is, you know, I, I, I should have secretaries to help the mayor be nice to his secretary. I used to fill the candy dishes around City Hall. I also emptied a lot of the candy dishes around City Hall. <laughs> waiting. Work the bars. Get to know the janitors. Get to know the trustees that they use for cleaning up around the police station or sheriff's office and doing tasks, if that's still going on. Um, journalism is not a linear task. It's using a lot of combination shots. And your, your mission is to find out thing, exclusively things that are hidden that citizens need to know and get them out there. Uh, sitting behind a computer all day, even with all the great resources that we have on the web, and man, it is something else. I mean, use follow the money. That can, that can, we could never have done that before. What it would have taken to get the information that follow the money can provide you and, and cross-correlate it <coughs> literally would have been impossible. So while the web has served to diffuse uh, the distribution of information, while it has served to raise the background noise level so that it makes it almost impossible for you to push an important story onto the state or national agenda, um, it also has given us tools that we never had before to gather information that we never had before. Uh, everything kind of offsets the, uh, uh, the the ability to gather it has increased exponentially. The difficulty in pushing it on to the top of the public agenda. Um, develop relationships with people like him, so that if he sees something on your blog, or you give him a call and say, hey, I've got this, he doesn't immediately go, mm -hmm, maybe, you know. I mean, are you going to stick your neck out based on somebody you don't trust? No. You have to develop that trust. You have to develop your credibility. It takes years to build it, and you can destroy it in a, in a minute. You can destroy it with one entry on your blog. The other thing I would recommend is that you all cross-link, whether you love each other, hate each other, whether you're the Montana cowgirl or whatever. Um, cross-link. Put Follow the Money, a logo and a link, on your website. Uh, there, are a couple of, there are a couple of other good ones out there that will um, give you a, uh, a uh, You know, people coming to your site will basically have places to go where they can get information, where they can check things out and maybe get back to you. 
Uh, do, you, do you, a lot of y'all get some regular action of people feeding back to you from your blogs? Please, raise your hands. Okay. And so you don't feel like it's just going out into the void every day when you do stuff. The other thing I would really recommend, and we talked about it earlier, is to identify yourself. I mean, that's the key to credibility. I'm saying it, I'm putting my name on it, anybody's got a problem with this, they know who to talk to. Talk to me about it. Put your name on it. I, I looked at the Montana Cowgirl site a while back and it, it's pretty cool. I mean, I didn't really learn much, but um, it's, it's <coughs> pretty sparky. Uh, but I take absolutely, I would never use anything from a site like that, ever. It's like somebody's putting my neck on the line instead of putting their own neck. If they, if they can't back it up with their name, then why should I trust it? And that's another fundamental thing about journalism 101 and dealing with sources. I know it's difficult, but everything's on the record unless you specifically agree to it otherwise. And don't agree to off the record unless you have a really good reason to and push the source. I've been burned too many times, especially in, uh, with uh, politicians and public officials who really want to float something out. I've had the people who slipped me the information off the record promise me you'll never, Frank, don't ever, you'll never tell anybody I told you this, okay? And then they're the ones up standing up in the county commissioner's meeting or city council meeting leading the lynch mob against me for revealing it. They wanted it out. They wanted to play both sides. They want to sling the mud, or whatever else you want to call it, without getting any on their hands. Um, be careful with it. You get sucker punched a couple of times, you start learning about that. Uh, make them go on the record. Make them use their names. Quote them by name. Uh, it may mean you have to wait a little longer to, to get something on your blog, but uh, it'll be worth it. I'd like to, um, we're going to break for lunch in a little bit, right? I would like to uh, answer any questions or any specific things you've had to deal with um, for this part. Anybody? Hey, Michael, please. Mm -hmm. uh, my experience has been a lot of times when people say they want to go off the record, I ask them why. And sometimes they'll just crumble right in front of you because they really don't know why other than they saw somebody on TV say that in a show or a movie or something like that. So a lot of times if you just say why, they really have to fish for an answer as to why they want to do it. Another thing is if somebody goes off the record with you, make sure you know when they're back on the record. And sometimes that's why I see, you know, somebody says this is off the record and then they'll talk for 15 minutes. You know, I usually interrupt them and I say, are we back on the record? I, I, I get them to tell me, yeah, we are back on the record. So, I mean, if you do get, find yourself in that hell, I, I would uh, pose those two questions. Uh, it, it all sort of depends on, you know, whether you're dealing with a politician or a human. I mean, if you're dealing with somebody who, <laughs> that's the very first time they've ever dealt with a reporter and they, and they ramble on, uh, you know, you want to be make sure that they they understand that you're going to, I mean, I would, I would call people and say, identify myself, I'm with the Journal and Courier newspaper, but I'm a reporter, I'm working on a story for today's paper about X, and they would go on and tell me great stuff, and I'd say, hey, thank you very much, i got to go get, get my story done, and they said, well, you're not going to print that, are you? And if I was a sarcastic person and cruel, I'd say, oh no, I just wanted it for my own gratification. I mean, it's kind of like, what the hell do these people think <laughs> journalists do? You gather information for print. Um, but if you're dealing with a politician or a major player or a power broker or somebody in the business community who's very savvy and, and, uh, and, and has been around and has been in the arena, um, you know, they, they understand, make sure they understand. Everything's on the record and yet, unless you explicitly in advance agree to it being off the record. They tell you something and go, well, you can't print that. Just smile and print it. Um, then they'll come after you and you can usually get another good story. 
How many, how many of y'all do any like original on the street going out and getting it reported? Working sources? Okay, should be more of you. Otherwise you're just chewing on the, on the same stuff that uh, somebody else has gathered. Somebody has to go get it. It's like farming, it's like mining. Um, you know, supermarket managers are not farmers, though they may think they are. Somebody has to go get it. And that's what we've lost. That's what newspapers have cut, radio stations have cut, TV stations have cut. It's the number one complaint I've heard from readers for 30 years is, you weren't there. You're not there. Go to meetings, um, and, you know, sub-meetings, committee hearings, work the halls of government and business, um, and I guess even in, in nowadays, uh, all the states, church, um, are violating more laws than you can shake a stick at and get away with it. But you have to be out there and get to know people one-on-one. -on -one. They have to trust you personally, and they'll tell you things. Yes, ma'am. Now, I have a um, <laughs> You're not from Montana, are you? No. Yeah, okay. Well, let me tell you, uh, we have very small, some very small newspapers. I have an example of a newspaper in Granite County. I have an example of going to the meetings. We go to the meetings. Not many people do. I take notes. Sometimes I record it. If I can get a newspaper to print it, that's one thing. I'm not a journalist, but they do have a journalist. We went to a meeting to give you an example. Um, there was only four people there. The journalist was not one of them. But he had two stories in the local newspaper where he took the credit for the byline. And um, I'm going to talk to the editor come Monday when he's around. But this is a problem that we have. And we don't have a journalist. We don't have a very rare report of um, um, investigative journalists and Lee Enterprises, which is one of the biggest that we have here, you do have to get the editor to um, get an, have an interest in it, in something. And, and that's one of the problems that I have, and I'm sure a lot of other people, where Valley County is experiencing a major problem trying to get the Missoulian to do something with it, and we're not getting there. And here's something that we always get in this state. If you don't like what we're doing, this is from the government, sue us. So a citizen <coughs> journalist does not have the funds. I think what we need, and this is for the groups that are here, maybe an in-house lawyer, um, like the environmentalists have, like the other side has, um, that comes to somebody's well, aid. Right, thanks for, we didn't plan this, but thanks for teeing up this afternoon session. Uh, in defense of the paper, and I don't know the specifics, but I know, I remember when corporate wisdom started coming down of like, people don't like meeting stories, we can't waste money sending reporters to meetings, da 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 You can just call, just call the mayor and get the information, or just call the commissioner, commission president and get the information and do a story. And I went to the meetings anyway. My wife estimates I've got 30,000 hours of community service in because I would go and not get paid for it, but I just wasn't going to do a story without being there. Um, the other thing that started happening is they cut back reporters. And, you know, Lee has uh, got a bottom line to me, like everybody else. I think their, their reduction in newsroom staff has been astounding. And very honestly, at the same time, they shifted more non-journalism duties into the newsroom, where the IT maintenance people, where the paginators and production people, uh, uh, they're, they're reporters who sometimes now can't make daytime meetings because they have to move the uh, stuff from one system to the other so it'll be on the web. And I'm thinking, that's really not gathering any new information. It might just be a lazy reporter, I don't know. The fact of the matter is, is the don't go to meetings mantra started about 30 years ago, and it started at the top that you can do a story without going to the meeting. And all I heard from citizens was what you just said. Why aren't you there? Why weren't you there? And we aren't there because it was the policy of the corporate suits to not do that, basically. Uh, it was just fill it up with as cheapest way you can with anything you can. And, and uh, uh, they, they forgot 
a few, they forgot how we make money, they forgot what our mission is, and very honestly, I think every news company in this country has kind of gone to a cut and run attitude. If we were faced with New York versus Minnesota again, which I'll talk about in the next session, I don't think it would ever get to the Supreme Court. Um, and, and, and it's sad, and, it, and it's, it's taking people like you again to fill the void. What I want to try to do is for you to get the tools necessary to fill that void, for you to learn the things you need to know to, to do it without getting, without getting mangled. Earlier, you were making some kind of historical references, you know, citizen journalists as pamphleters and, you know, the birth of our country. And so what, uh, what groups would you identify as the Tories today? And the, the, the British uh, professional soldiers? Well, the, the, the professionals are uh, the people in, uh, generally in government, in the government unions, and, and the um, power structures that um, uh, feed off of and support government. Um, that, that, that it, it's really kind of astounding the first time I know as a young reporter you run up against them and, and uh, Who are they, they can be vicious. It can be anything from a school superintendent to a mayor to a governor to a senator to a congressman. It could be business interests. It could be uh, people who support uh, uh, the think tanks and other, other groups, you don't know. It could be uh, people in industry. Um, it's, you know, there's always a power structure and they always want things their way. I, I think, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that the one true unifying force in American public life that goes beyond party or politics or um, political philosophy is corruption. I mean, everybody, the Wall Street Journal talks about Chris Christie, the hardline conservative reformer in New Jersey. No, he's not. Uh, and his lieutenant governor got a, an illegal, patently illegal uh, pension deal for a crony of hers. And um, uh, except for our one watchdog blogger, I don't think anybody's picked up on it. Uh, when they get at the trough, my idea of reform is not a different set of people at the public trough ripping us off. Okay? Um, I, I'd say, I always said Republicans hate me because I'm against socialism. And people say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm sort of opposed to socialism. I'm even against socialism for the rich. And um, I've been saying that for years before W pulled that first TARP program. But I thought it made the point. Uh, I really, you know, where the hell was the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and Bloomberg uh, prior to the market crash? Where were they prior to Bernie Madoff? Were they getting the job done? No, they weren't getting the job done. Uh, and, and I think the same thing happens. I, I really do think that a, a lot of that was probably just not being willing to pay a pittance, by the way. Journalists work cheap. Uh, not being willing to, to pay a reporter to take the time to really get on it. I know that's the case with the state municipal pension crisis. It is so complicated that they were able to pull it off right under our noses because no news media really would invest in somebody to, um, to learn it, understand it, dig into the mind-numbing complexity of it, and, and put the stories out there. Um, the, the, the thing is, is no matter who's in power, I mean, it's, that's who you're going to go up against. They have it, you know. One more question. Uh, Mr. Keegan, I want to compliment you for your advice to the group here about making sure you check your facts and, and double check them. Um, and so as a, as a factual matter, I'm probably one of those less than human people. I was a public servant for 30 years in the state of Montana. I would say that uh, in that uh, whole time of 30 years uh, in public service, I never asked a reporter to go off the record. And I think I can count on my, on one hand, the number of times when a reporter asked me if I would answer a question. Uh, they'd ask a question, I'd say, I'm not ready to answer that because I don't have the facts and the data, and I shouldn't, I, I would just be offering me hearsay, so I won't answer it. And so they, they, they'd want to be off the record to find out what it was I was looking at. 
Now whether, but that didn't happen very frequently, just a small, small number of occasions. Um, but I guess it, it um, as, as a young person going to 4-H camp, I remember this one time we did an exercise. We sat 15 kids around in a circle and, and the 4-H leader gave the first one uh, an interesting little factual tidbit and told that person to tell the person next to him and it was to go around all the way around this group of 15 and when it got the last one, that last one then announced what it was the first one had told. Uh, his partner and 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 typically the answer was entirely different from what was originally uh, stated and uh, and so I want to get your impression about the the risk in the in the in in the citizen journalism and in the blogosphere and not properly checking facts that that you would end up with people citing other people who said something and somehow in the whole process working its way around that circle, uh, the, 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 the final thing that shows up that most people would end up seeing isn't the truth. I, I think that's definitely happening. One thing, congratulations for being a public official who'd stand up and, and say it and take the hit. We love, I gotta say, reporters, real journalists love, love public officials like you. They, they tend to lose elections, but um, the liars have a huge advantage, the deceivers have a huge advantage in, in politics, unfortunately, um, as we see again and again and again. But um, the one thing, of, like, get to original sources, one of the things if somebody's telling you something, you go, well, how do you know this? Were you there? Did you hear it? Well, no, my cousin talked to a guy who said, the mayor said, not good enough. Find somebody who was in the room. Find somebody who was there, who saw it, who heard it, will put their name behind it. Who will stand up and say, I heard the mayor say it, and here's my name. Um, uh, what you're talking about of the misinformation circle is happening on a global scale now. And uh, once again, it truly wonderful things are happening. Power structures have more trouble controlling information, as we can see in the in the Middle East, as we can see in China, uh, as we can see all over the world, they're trying to get control of the information flow. But at the other, the other side of that equation is, you know, what's the, there is an older saying, an ancient one, that a lie goes around the world faster than the truth can get out of town. And the, the misinformation seems to just grow and propagate faster than the good information. There's a thing called Gresham's Law with money, is that the bad money pushes out good money, which I think we're gonna learn the hard way again in the next decade in this country. And I think the same thing can apply to information. The bad information drives out the good information. You have people like Follow the Money who are putting the rock, doing, doing their homework, checking it out, auditing it independently, putting it out there for people. But I tell you, the work and cost involved in what they're doing is exponentially higher than the work and cost involved in somebody just blathering out a lie. And, you know, that, that could be a fundamental problem. What I want you all to commit yourselves to, if you leave this room with nothing else from this session, get the AP style book and read it, okay? Look at some of the pointer stuff and read it try to become a more solid information provider, okay? Get original stuff, verify it, corroborate it, put somebody's name behind it. It's a lot of work, it's hard work, and it can be dangerous work, as we'll find out later. So if, you, if, if everybody in this room does that, if 10 million citizens across America do that, uh, our country might make it. But if you're just part of the misinformation stream, if you're just in the circle that's distorting the news as it goes around the circle, you're part of the problem, you're not part of the solution.